Hello, wow, there's a lot of you. Um, this is Scully, this is our mascot. Um, it was 3D printed by one of my friends, and actually the name was inspired by a company that, oh sorry, uh, the company that has also failed. Uh, I had this on my workspace desk and people thought I was very weird. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, the theme of end. So when I got asked to speak uh, at Creative Mornings, first of all, I was super excited. And then, you know, the theme around end was really interesting because a lot of the times you see these founders who have started lots of companies and then they go on to create new ones. And so what, what happens to those companies that fail? Um, before I start, there's a term, there's a quote by Reid Hoffman, who's the LinkedIn founder, which you might have heard of before, which is, entrepreneurship is like jumping off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down. It's probably one of the most scariest things you want to do because it's risk-taking, you don't know where you're going to end up in the next three, four years. Uh, you might be very successful, you might fail. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of you know, personal issues, financial issues, isolation. There's all these things that are not really spoken about and it's not very glamorous. Um, it's a whole different type of demeanor and this is what basically separates uh, some from others. So some will carry on, some will, uh, some will, some will uh, stay or they will go. So for example, here you've got Jeff Bezos, good of Jeff. Jeff, and he, this is him in 1999 uh, in, his, in his Amazon uh, office and Amazon actually didn't make a profit until about 14 years later since inception. So uh, this shows a lot of perseverance, uh, a lot of courage, a lot of patience. Uh, and so this is one side of the story. So it, it is possible, it can happen. Um, so just a little bit of a background on why um, I'm looking at failure. Uh, so back in 2011-2012, I set up my first company. It was an ethical menswear company uh, on an e-commerce site, and uh, we were trying to bring more sustainability into the fashion industry. Uh, it's the second most polluted industry in the world, and so I didn't want to create a brand which you know jeopardised people in the process of making the clothes, and also it brought transparency into the industry. You mean like fast forward to today, everyone's talking about it, right? Back then. We were seen as hippies, do-gooders, and all this kind of stuff, and we were labelled as like, you know, this is not going to work, blah, blah, blah. So we carried on, and um, we raised some funding, we raised about £200,000, and uh, this is my co-founder uh, back then, and we um, decided to lease our own studio factory in Bangladesh, because we wanted to have transparency into every aspect of the of the business. So um, this is us actually, the first first few days, the first week when we actually got the studio, and so we were designing and selling in, in London, and then we were selling across the world as well to San Francisco and uh, um, Australia. So, uh, so we closed the company down in 2015. After four years, <sighs> trying to explain this to anyone, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you in here have probably started anything, uh, started startup, sorry, and feel how it feels, but I was, I was thinking that by the age of 25, because I was 18, 19 then, I was like, by the age of 25, I'm going to change the fashion industry. It's going to happen. I'm going to revolutionize it. Um, we're going to bring awareness to the uh, industry, but it, it didn't happen. And so there were multiple reasons as to why it didn't work. I was a very, very young CEO. Um, trusting me with finances was not a good idea because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And um, our team just started to get really fragmented in like the vision. We didn't agree on the same things anymore. Um, uh, a lot of my founders were actually older than me, so they had a lot more like life you know, responsibilities, like kids, mortgages, and I was just staying at my mum's. So it was a very different kind of, yeah, it was a very different type of lifestyle, but also there were nuances in terms of like the business side of things, like the strategic stuff, where, you know, we were trying to go for the more affordable demographic of, um, you know, young boys who were like skateboarders, who were musicians and so on, to be able to afford something really good, and wear organic clothing. Um, but our margins were very, very tight, so we were hardly making any profit, so we were struggling a lot of times. So we closed the company, and I, in 2015, I was like, F this. <laughs> I'm gonna leave London, and I had enough of London, I was enough, I had enough of the busyness of it, I just wanted to get out, I wanted to leave. Um, so I uh, started freelancing, my background is predominantly digital marketing, so I got a client, and I basically went and I traveled across Budapest and Berlin and some parts of Europe, and I just had to get away. In that time, I was spending a lot of time kind of doing a retrospect and, and thinking what actually went wrong, why did it not work out, and should I have stayed? And in that time, I thought, well, surely there's other people that have written stories about their failure. 
Um, and why is it not that, especially in tech, especially in technology, you see a lot of people that agree with the statement that there's not enough retrospect. There's a lot of, like, as Al said, there's a lot of fast companies, there's a lot of failures, but no one's really looking at what actually goes wrong and can indicators be spotted for existing and future companies. Um, gathered all the information, put it on a, um, put it on a WordPress site, and this is what it looked like back in 2015. It's just literally a Google Sheets on a WordPress X theme, and it just went live. So it was all these stories, it was like the idea, the name, why it went wrong, and like the full story, and then the founder. Um, at the time, I remember this day, because it's, it's, it's really strange what happened. It was June 2015, I was in Berlin, I was staying with a friend of mine at the time, and he helped me put the site live. Um, we put it on Product Hunt, um, and it went crazy on Product Hunt, it got upvoted, loads of people started commenting on it, and then also went on Hacker News, and then it got picked up by uh, Mark Andreessen, who is, um, I don't know if you know the investor, Andreessen Horowitz, one of these like big Silicon Valley dudes. People were like, yeah, this is a brilliant idea. This is like basically you know, a, a directory of successful, future successful companies. Um, I went out for a beer, and I was like, okay, weird. Went out for a beer, went to see one of my friends, and then my, my friend who I was staying with was like, you need to come back, we've got Bloomberg, and we've got The Next, where we've got all these people that want to talk to us about failure. I was like, this is so weird. Because I'm in, I'm in marketing and everything we try to do is try to hit a viral marketing campaign. So when you have clients like, yeah, you make my, make, make my campaign go viral, there's just no formula around it. So this was really, really weird. So this is just really quickly some of our, I would call vanity metrics. Uh, so we've had about 2,000 um, failure submissions to date. So these are actually people coming onto our website who are founders, who are CEOs of um, uh, not just startups, but you know, uh, scale-ups, um, uh, CTOs, CMOs, C-level employees, and so on. And we have over 12,000 subscribers of you know, a mix of investors, VCs, and so on. And so there is an interest on this topic. Um, so just some kind of um, background and statistics and as to why I decided to incorporate it as a company last year. Uh, not just because of the traction that I was getting and the level of submissions and interest that I kept getting, but also that I started to get into the, um, I started to realize there were a lot of, a lot of issues and there was a lot of problems. And so like, so for example, you get like really bad stats, like within three years, 90% of startups fail. Uh, you get like 75% of venture backed startups fail and they never return cash to their investors. So essentially, if you're an investor, three out of four of your uh, investments are not going to return any cash to you. So what's going on, right? Um, then there's like other levels of issues in terms of diversity. So you've got like 8% of UK VCs uh, have actually never worked in a startup. So they have no idea how it feels. <laughs> she's, she's like, yeah, I know what you mean. Right? No idea how it feels, how, how to run a company. So, uh, and they predominantly come from a banking um, background. Um, so, why do we exist? So, we are essentially what we call a data analytics company, and our focus has predominantly been to collect what we call historic data, uh, known as you know, failure, what we specify as failure data, and um, founder profile data to um, basically draw a better comparison when it comes to comparing successful companies and failure companies to basically make the end results um, more applicable. Um, so we're trying to get over this like you know uh, uh, bias issue that stop looking only at successful factors and also look at failure factors. Look at the other side of the coin essentially. Um, this is my boring slide, so bear with me. But I thought it would be interesting for you to know um, how we capture the information, how we collect the data, and what I actually mean by data. So um, essentially, we have this comprehensive list, which is our database that we're constantly updating. So we rely heavily on the submissions because of our validation that we've had. People are submitting their stories to us. We also go out to our partners who are venture capital firms, accelerators, and we say, you know, who has failed in your portfolio? Uh, give us their, you know, give us their names and their causations of failure, and then we can give you back an analysis as to what went wrong. So it helps your future investments in the same sector. Um, and then we go sector by sector. We um, we choose a location. So we've got a lot of U.S.-based companies. Um, but now we're looking into more like London-based companies. Uh, Southeast Asia is like huge for this stuff now because they're developing, so they want to see what goes wrong. Uh, and then we draw the analysis. We do uh, a lot around kind of like sentiment analysis and text mining, gathering a lot of articles 
uh, as, uh, as to why this company had failed to draw a narrative and then we you know, plop that into our database and sell it to the customers. Um, so for example here you can see an example of uh, eMove. Uh, you've probably heard of eMove, a London based startup, um, prop tech company and it, uh, it got beaten basically by Purple Bricks, uh, superior competition by Purple Bricks and um, you, you saw this interest between this interesting kind of like relationship between Russell and Evan, who were the co-founders, where he always had another thing on the side, right? <laughs> it was it was quite weird because they raised quite a lot of money, so they raised about 23 million 23 million dollars, um, and they actually um, what full this guy wasn't full time; he was a CTO. So there was there was a lot of that. There was a bit of a lack of focus. There was a lot of like I want to do a lot of different things. So there wasn't. It seems like from the very beginning there was no real trust and commitment to the business. Um, so we also trying to uh, launch, uh, or we are launching the Autopsy Academy, which is for uh, startups. So essentially, uh, if you are about to start your own company. Uh, and you want to learn what went wrong in other companies, you can learn it from our program here. So this is quite interesting for startups out there if you want to talk about it more. Um, so, why did they fail? So we ran this with, um, we did a partnership with Forward Partners, who's a VC in London, and, um, do you know them? <laughs> and um, they wanted us to look at 30, uh, 300, sorry, 300 very early stage tech companies. So these were in software, they were in uh, e-commerce, mobile, etc. And the 10 core reasons that we derived, I mean, you would appreciate that behind all of this, there's more to it, right? But, you know, for the sake of this talk, this is the high level. Um, so the first thing that came out, which was really interesting, is that it was not the right team. So there's a lot of notions around, you know, having to start something and being desperate to find, because I'm not, for example, I'm not technical. So I'm constantly looking for, like, you know, a CTO or, like, a developer, and, like, all these, like, they seem like, gold dust, these people, it's like hard to touch, can't find any, like, you know, that kind of stuff. So like, uh, and then you get desperate around finding anyone, just anyone that fits. And then so you have problems with equity and then there's all these other issues around legal terms and so on. So there's a lot of problems when it comes to team selection and the investors that invest in these companies um, don't help with talent acquisition or hiring. That's the other problem as well. Um, but you, to be fair to the VCs, because they are actually our end customers, so I shouldn't <laughs> talk bad about them so much. But they are doing a lot more in terms of like uh, being more hands-on and doing a lot more around talent and so on. So you've got the second, which is basically unsustainable business model, so not getting the business model done right from the very beginning. Uh, profit margins are, are poorly conducted. And then you've got like product is basically not here, the product doesn't work, the product doesn't have a market, for example. There's a lot around kind of um, this thing called like founder's ego, so you know, I'm gonna build something because I feel like, <laughs> I'm gonna build something because I feel like, you know, I want it, so surely you guys want it too, right? So there's this kind of notion around that. And there's also this notion around, you know, being glamorous and having a startup, like it's cool, right? Like it's cool to have a startup. It's cool to like go work in a work, so it's like, I've got, you know, my Mac out, I'm gonna work on my startup, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like, dude, you're probably gonna fail. Or like something's gonna, something's gonna happen, right? It's gonna come to an end. Something's gonna go terribly wrong. So like, let's learn how to try to avoid them at least. Um, so the industries that you saw people issues a lot in was surprisingly software, uh, digital media is like kind of like social network sites. There's a lot around. We had a lot around. Um, I think it was like 2009, 2010. We had loads of submissions of companies that were social media sites because they were trying to be like the Facebook. They were trying to compete. Uh, and I'll show you some examples later. Um, so here's one example, which uh, I, uh, it's an interesting startup, but I just really like her quote. So I'll tell you what, about, uh, what it is about after her quote. So she wrote this post-mortem, I think, straight uh, after her company failed. Uh, and then she wrote, uh, so startups are, uh, are so cool right now that it's easy to forget how terribly naive, blindly optimistic, and delusional startup founders have to be to think their company will succeed over others, especially over others with similar ideas in the same market. She sounds really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> but she sums it up super well, right? And so her company was like a um, fashion discovery platform. So, you know, um, you know, women who wanted to buy a t-shirt that had like a pink logo on it. You know, they would have they would have they would have show like similar items online that you can go and find, kind of like a Pinterest, you know, essentially. 
Um, so her, her cause issues of failure, she was running the company for about three years. Her issues were that um, she was desperate to find a CTO. So she found this guy, she found this developer, and when it was all coming to an end, the CTO basically, the dev basically just took all the code and ran off with it. And she was basically left with, like, she had no funds in the, in the business because she was burning a lot of cash. She had no budgeting skills. She wasn't budgeting correctly. And the guy just like, took, 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 took the code and she couldn't start again. So she had a really, really unfortunate, obviously, um, you know, scenario, um, but it can happen. So um, that's one example. That's one example on a, sorry, on a, um, I would say, uh, her, she only raised about 200,000 pounds. Um, so this is not a large scale type of failure. This is just like one side of the spectrum of like smaller scale uh, companies <laughs> when they fail. So Yik Yak, I don't know if you've heard of Yik Yak, based in Sami. <laughs> um, Yik Yak was an anonymous um, social media app. So uh, you didn't have, you didn't, you didn't say who you were. Uh, it was basically more or less coming up at the same time as Snapchat. Snapchat completely obliterated it essentially, but they did very well. They had a very good track record. Um, one thing that was an issue on their platform actually was that their platform started to get prone to bullying. So a lot of people, a lot of different profiles would start bullying each other, you know, start like commenting each other. I mean, I, I don't know based on what, because you can't see anything, but people were bullying each other constantly. And so this was one of the major hurdles after raising so much money. I think they raised, it says it here somewhere, oh yeah, 400 million. 400 million dollars, uh, they could not go past this. So they were thinking, okay, so what do we do? Do we pivot? Do we give up? Uh, so they tried to pivot. So they tried to change the product direction to make it non-anonymous. Uh, it didn't stick, it didn't catch, because the people were diverting over to Snapchat at that point. So it was too late. Uh, they closed the company down. Um, Theranos. You've probably heard, you've probably seen her face in a lot of <laughs> places online. Oh. So, <laughs> watch the dropout. Listen to the dropout. It's amazing. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Because they've got a book coming out as well, don't they, about it? So, this was a blood test company which she started back in 2003 when she was actually 19, and by that point she managed to raise about 400 million dollars, which is pretty outstanding. Like it's pretty sweet, but on a product that didn't even work, right? So she managed to basically pull the pull the cloth over the, the, the investor's eyes and say like, okay, right, um, you know, give me all this money. So this didn't work out, but this is a, one, of the, one of the issues when it comes to fraud. This is, this is quite weird to say, you know, what type of failure is this? Because it's kind of borderline fraud. Um, there are so many nuances to the story though, which is so hard to say what the causations are because there was the chairman and the president who was involved and so maybe she was a puppeteer of his master plan, you know who they were also intimate with. So many things. Um, so, interesting story. But then this, these kinds of topics and these kinds of, sorry, failures, which is like the Theranuses and the fire festivals and so on, uh, that you might have seen on Netflix, draw a lot of attention more to what's going on in technology and, and things going absolutely wrong. And people actually just giving money freely, you know, intensively into these companies without actually doing enough due diligence. Um, Scully is over there. Uh, Scully was, which was, uh, this was, this was quite a cool one because it was quite uh, different in terms of the way it raised funding. Uh, so it was a motorbike helmet uh, and it raised a lot of money on Indiegogo, it raised over 2.5 million on a crowdfunding site and then an additional 11, mil 11 million dollars on, uh, from external investors. This one is an interesting story because um, they were, they were, ra they raised a lot of money. They had so much cash, but the founders decided to spend it on strippers. <laughs> Uh, hiring lim limousines, like throwing like extravagant parties, uh, staff parties, and just blowing the cash at a ridiculous level. I mean, there was probably some drugs and stuff involved there, right? So like, there were so many things going on within this, and these are like the kind of like scandalous, kind of like juicy s stories that we see, which are quite interesting to see, but then you also want to look at, from a learning perspective, um, when it comes to like founder profiling or when it comes to investors giving money to these founders, what are they actually looking at? What nuances are they looking at? Um, obviously things like this would be hard to predict. You don't know if someone's gonna spend money on loads of strippers and like go nuts with it. Um, but um, when it comes to the profiling aspect of it, a lot of times VCs find it super, super difficult to see how do you screen uh, founders. 
So one angle that we're trying to go in to help these guys is to say, okay, we've got like a database of all these different types of founders, here's our, or here's our analysis on every single one of these guys, and so maybe you should look out for these kind of issues. Um, so what happens to these startups after they fail? Um, so about the 2,000 or so that I said that we have, more than 60% of them go on to create new companies. Uh, now, whether those companies are going to work or not, some of some have failed and have tried on again and again. Some go and work in corporates, but essentially, for them, it's certainly not the end. So um, it's not the end. I think I'm. I think I'm done. I think I'm, done. I think I'm out of time. Uh, yeah. There you go.